Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. It was a big issue in Baton Rouge. We wind up uh, getting heavily involved in it. Congressman Cedric Richmond on postal issues hitting Louisianans hard. I literally slept for like two and a half days. And LSU professors march bout with the coronavirus as he heads back to class. At this point in my life, I thought I would be dead. We hear American portrait stories from seniors at the Oaks of Louisiana. I'll always be short. I won't get taller, but it doesn't affect me much. Tonight's featured young hero has the will and will always find a way. Hi, I'm Natasha Williams. Andre's enjoying some much needed time off this week on the state we're in. New studies suggest 53,000 people in the capital city area were infected or had been infected by the coronavirus through August 2nd. Among those tested, around 60% were asymptomatic. That's why experts say it's so important to wear a mask. Now here's a look at the latest coronavirus numbers from around the state. The Louisiana Department of Health reported 899 more coronavirus cases, 50 more deaths, and 36 fewer hospitalizations in its daily noon report. Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy has tested positive for the coronavirus. We learned yesterday Senator Cassidy was notified he'd been exposed to a person with the coronavirus. He was tested Thursday and the test was positive. We're told he is following CDC guidelines and quarantining for 14 days and notifying people he may have come in contact with recently. Now let's take a look at some of the news making headlines around the state. The governor announced Louisiana should start issuing checks for $300 in weekly federal coronavirus unemployment aid next week, but as many as 87,000 people receiving state unemployment may not be eligible for the federal assistance. The state expects to receive $375 million in federal funds by the end of the week to start paying it out. Congress approved $600 in weekly federal unemployment payments on top of the state's pay, but that enhanced benefit expired last month. Louisiana's work to track coronavirus cases to help slow the spread of the outbreak can't keep up with the state's pace of new infections. Health Department officials have used information they've gathered through phone calls to pinpoint a few hundred coronavirus outbreaks, but they also say they've run into major issues with the contact tracing. They say for those people they do reach, nearly 75 percent don't provide details about close contacts they've had. A federal judge in New Orleans refuses to block a state order closing bars to stop the spread of COVID-19 after 10 Southeast Louisiana bar owners tried to sue to reopen. The judge said the governor's closure order was legal under public health emergencies such as the current pandemic. A tropical depression in the Atlantic Ocean is expected to reach the Gulf of Mexico next week as a Category 1 hurricane is expected to strengthen into a hurricane on Sunday or Monday. Forecasters also are tracking two other systems, including one in the Caribbean, that's expected to develop into a tropical depression. A police jury in Calcasieu Parish votes to keep a Confederate monument on public grounds after hearing from residents about a motion to remove that statue since late June. The police jury voted 10 to 4 on Thursday to let the South Defender Monument remain where it stands on the grounds of a courthouse in Lake Charles. A new report says one in four Louisiana students lack the Internet access needed to take virtual classes as schools resume with heavy emphasis on remote learning. The report quotes State Superintendent Kate Brumley, who says we're in a better place than four months ago, but we still have a long way to go. A report released by the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education says 86 percent of Louisiana school districts are starting with a combination of virtual and in-person learning. Crawfish farmers are now eligible for a $16 billion coronavirus aid program run by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Crawfish are among a number of commodities added to the coronavirus food assistance program announced in May. Louisiana's congressman, state ag commissioner, the Louisiana Farm Bureau, and LSU Ag Center have all been pushing to add farmed crawfish to the list. 
Earlier this week, Governor John Ball Edwards signed an executive order declaring an emergency exists for Louisiana's November election because of COVID-19. He said point blank, the Secretary of State's current emergency election plan is not enough to protect public health. I do want to be clear that while I issued that emergency declaration, it does not mean that I approve the specific plan that has been put together uh, by the Secretary of State. And in fact, I do not support his plan. Um, I don't believe that it accommodates all the voters uh, that should be accommodated in this public health emergency so that they don't need to go out and physically um, move to a polling location, whether it's in early voting on or on election day. I don't believe that that plan goes far enough. It doesn't take into account the seriousness of this global pandemic, uh, the health and safety of the voters. Republicans on the House and Governmental Affairs Committee voted to advance the emergency plan proposed by GOP Secretary of State Kyle Ardois to the full House for consideration. It eliminates most of the coronavirus related reasons for a person to request an absentee ballot, requiring most people to vote in person despite the virus outbreak unless they have recently tested positive for COVID-19. We of course will be following this story and hope to have a conversation with the Secretary of State about the issue. Congressman Cedric Richmond has been very busy this week as he joins fellow lawmakers tomorrow in a rare Saturday vote on a measure to fund the United States Post Office. He has spent most of the week in his role as national co-chair of the Joe Biden for President campaign. Even more reason, he says, for the push to end interference currently being waged by President Trump's hand-picked Postmaster General. Today, the Postmaster General answered tough questions for Congress about changes Richmond and others say should be reversed. Let's talk about um, what the Democratic caucus has called an assault on the United States Post Office. Well, it is. The sad part is it's an attack from within. And the United States Postal Service is so important to America that it's in the Constitution and that it wasn't designed to make money. It was designed to provide a needed and necessary service. So now that you have a uh, administration and a postmaster general that appears to be pulling up um, mailboxes that people usually normally deposit mail and they get picked up. They're taking sorting machines out of post offices and they're delaying postal service. So if you look in Baton Rouge, especially in that North Baton Rouge area, they've been affected uh, tremendously. I think they have a shortfall of 29 uh, postal workers there. You have a place in Gretna, also in my district, where they have a shortfall. And so the it's, it's an attack on uh, everything we know. And a lot of people depend on the post office to deliver merchandise, mail, money, medicine. And so that is key. And we have to make sure that we protect it, especially for small businesses and our seniors. Five-term Louisiana Congressman Cedric Richmond, former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and first national co-chair of the Joe Biden for President campaign, has had an extremely busy week and he says in the days ahead, he'll be even busier. How are you going to do it? I mean, I know that they're bringing in um, the postmaster general for uh, a hearing, which he's agreed to, but I yep. mean, how do you stop it? I mean, they, they said that they will stop um, pulling up the boxes, but what about the ones they've already pulled up? You know, what about those people who are affected, you know, out in front of senior citizens' homes and things like that? What we're gonna do is go back in the session on Saturday, this Saturday and we will pass legislation on Saturday to uh, the $25 billion that Trump's appointees uh, at the post office, the board of trustees, which are all appointed by Trump, said that they needed 25 billion for the postal service. And so we're gonna pass that, but in that will be that they have to restore service just like it was. With pressure and potential lawsuits from more than 20 states Tuesday, the Postmaster General did suspend so-called cost-cutting changes at post offices around the country, changes that many critics saw as voter suppression meant to help President Donald Trump. Representative Richmond says our nation needs great healing in the middle of our battle with a deadly pandemic. Well, look, we're going to encourage people to early vote, which in Louisiana we have, what, seven days of early voting, in-person early voting for people to show up. 
in a socially distanced manner, take the health precautions and vote for them. I'll tell you one thing though, this is not the first time that African Americans will have had to risk their health to go to the polls and vote. Uh, my colleague, John Lewis, showed us all that on uh, Bloody Sunday. And uh, I think that in our tribute to our uh, ancestors who did all of those things that we're gonna go out and we're gonna vote, whether it's on election day, early voting or vote by mail, we're gonna show up uh, because we understand what's at stake uh, for this election. So, but we don't want people to have to put their lives at risk to vote. So we want them to do it in a safe manner uh, the manner that's best suited for them, but um, it's important. Richmond told us he sent letters to his constituents in Baton Rouge about the major mail delays they were having caused by recent postal changes. He told them it was unacceptable and is being investigated. Students will begin on-campus classes Monday at Louisiana State University, and Dr. Carl Motzenbacher will be among those professors heading back to teach the students. Dr. Motzenbacher knows all too well the dangers of the coronavirus. He, his wife, and son all got it. We asked him about his concerns. This is how longtime Louisiana State professor Dr. Carl Motzenbacher has spent year after year teaching horticulture and sustainable agriculture in the United States and abroad. But earlier this year, a trip to New Orleans to a conference planted him in his bed. It was a um, national meeting, about 300, 400 people. And the meeting ended on March 13th. And we were all trying to be um, social distancing. We didn't have a mask order at the time. Arriving back in Baton Rouge, he decided to do some yard work. I came home on Friday the 13th, worked outside on Saturday. I was uh, cutting down some trees that were on our property, a lot of pollen. So I, I had thought I had a bad case of allergies and um, I ended up being sick. His sickness, something that has killed more than 170,000 people, the coronavirus. Went to bed that night. I kind of had, you know, headaches, a little bit of fever and chills for the first 24 hours. And, and frankly, I think I had it pretty easy compared to most people. Nothing was in my chest, but I had headaches, like pounding, like uh, no, um, nasal congestion. Um, and then I, I woke up a couple times in the morning. I was just nauseous. And I do a lot of international travel, and I had some anti-nausea meds, you know. Um, and I just kind of take a shower and then just crawl back into bed. I didn't want to eat, didn't want to do anything. And it was just for a couple days. and then. The third day, I kind of woke up. I felt better, but I knew something was not normal. And I was just really tired for like about a week. And still these headaches. And, um, you know, and normally I have a fair amount of energy. You know, I like to go ride my bike and <laughs> go walking. And <laughs> so, yeah, and it, it was really actually hard to concentrate. He also lost his sense of smell, but information at the time was limited. Some of the symptoms not even known. Machenbacher asked his doctor to be tested, but he didn't meet the criteria. He wasn't done with the virus yet, though. My wife got sick. She had more of an in intestinal issue. She was sick for like three days. And then my son, he had that full-blown coughing, you know, laying in bed, you know, really nasty thing. And we were really worried about him. He was sick for like a week. It would be three months later when he got the antibodies test. I had my physical, it was either Monday or Tuesday, and at the very end of my physical, they said, oh, by the way, you test positive. They said, you're the first one in, in our group of the doctors that had a patient that tested positive. And I said, well, you probably aren't testing too many people. We've learned so much more about the coronavirus in the months since the first victims in late February and March, but we are still learning. And as cases in our state have spiked again, schools are reopening, including LSU. I'm teaching two classes. They both have labs. My classes are hands-on. So I have an organic gardening class and a vegetable crops class. So, um, and they, they basically say that being outside is actually safer than being in a classroom. So how do you feel though? I mean, you're gonna be around those college students and sometimes they're not so obedient <laughs> when it comes to stay in place, social distancing, staying away from Tigerland. 
Yeah, I guess that'll be a that'll be a tough one. I know I'll be wearing a mask. I'll be careful. I'll be washing my hands. Um, I think LSU has done a really good job of putting guidelines in place and enforcing. So even in the building, anytime you're in the building, unless you're in your office, you'll wear a mask. They're going to have stairways being either up or down, not mixed up and down stairways. The students are supposed to um, actually sanitize, sanitize their seats when they get into class and then sanitize them when they leave. So yeah, I've been thinking about it. You know, I don't know if I have any immunity currently. I heard you know, doubts that people can get it a second time, then I hear some people do get it a second time. So I'm looking at just trying to be as safe as possible. The professor was working with the university in Liberia the summer the Ebola virus broke out and told us he heard the horror stories and admits he was worried about getting the coronavirus, which he ultimately did. In the past several weeks, we've closed our broadcast inviting you to submit your PBS American Portrait. It's a storytelling initiative asking you and people all over the state and U.S. what it means to be American today. This week, we hear from those who've seen and experienced more than most of us, those who live in the Oaks of Louisiana, a sprawling senior living facility in Shreveport. At this point in my life, I thought I would be dead. But since she's not, a sense of humor has helped 78-year-old Jean Epler from Fort Smith, Arkansas, live life to the fullest. The current detour, though, forced by the pandemic, is hard. It has stopped many in their tracks. 86-year-old Millie Marquez from Shreveport is one of those who is seemingly suspended without the hope she's always known. When this is over, I will be one happy person person, but Lord only knows when it's going to be over. It has gone on longer than we thought it would. I have gone downhill with my uh, exercise. I haven't done it. I haven't been reading. I have just almost died, and that's a shame because I have so many good things to live for. The worst thing she's lived through. That's how 94-year-old Lola Russell from Zwale describes it. And the world disorder is something she never expected. I've been through all kinds of things in my life. I'm gonna be 95 on my birthday. But the worst thing that happened to me now is being not able to be with my family and be with friends. I just love people. The American Portraits Project is allowing people to open up about their feelings, to say what they need to say. Terry Roberts, public relations manager at the Oaks, says it's serving as a much needed diversion. You know, it was something kind of um, fun yeah. and thought provoking, but it gave uh, our activity coordinators as well something to, thank goodness we've got something we can offer, you know, that's different than what we're doing right now. It's given residents, like Jim Gibson of Shreveport, who's 94, a strong reminder why he's grounded in his faith. My greatest challenge, uh, remembering my faith in a God that I did not know, but I was raised to believe that my God and Savior uh, would be the one to uh, I would turn to in the time of need. Your residents seem to get into it and uh, embrace it, huh? Definitely. Um, as you well know, we are a community that has uh, independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. Some of our campus is still restricted. But most of our residents, whether they're independent or not, are pretty much staying in their homes. I used to believe there are three important things in this life. The Lord Jesus Christ and your church and then your family is second. I have a beautiful family, two daughters, a wonderful son-in-law and two precious grandchildren. 
I also was raised to believe that America is a great country and I believe it still will be a great country in times to come. Right now we're going through a difficult period, but we will survive. Survive and many say keep alive family traditions and their dream for America. Lorraine Shoemaker of Denton, Texas, who's 87, summed it up this way. My American dream is that we could live in peace throughout the world. God created each and every one of us, and we are all his children. We should not be looking at what color anyone is because we are still God's children regardless. LPB wants to make sure Louisianans' voices are heard in the National PBS American Portrait Storytelling Project. Choose a topic at pbs.org slash American Portrait, then submit your video, photo, or simply your thoughts. Share your story today. Tonight's LPB Louisiana Young Hero was born with Turner Syndrome, a rare random disorder that only affects female births. A multitude of health and physical problems come with it, though. Riley Morris from Leesville High School is short and small for her age, but as Andre Morrow reports, her positive attitude is larger than life. I'll always be short. I won't get taller, but it doesn't affect me much. That's Riley Mars of Leesville. You heard what she said, I'll always be short, but it doesn't affect me much. Here's how Mayo Clinic describes problems that Turner's patients can face. And we're just giving a few. Besides heart problems, high blood pressure, hearing loss, vision, kidney, and skeletal problems, developmental issues. The list is long. What's the biggest challenge with this condition that you have? Well, sometimes I can't reach the high, the highest shelf. <laughs> okay, any others? Well, not that I can think of, but sometimes I get teased, but it's okay. We've never let her use her short stature as a crutch. Um, we've always expected her to be positive and look at the best of her situation. There are a lot of things that are challenging for her but we don't dwell on that. What they dwell on are things that will matter as and how she lives her life and achieves her goals. Now a junior at Leesville High in Vernon Parish, she's involved in school organizations and does volunteer work, like visiting nursing homes and serving at the Senior Citizens Luncheon. She's been a cheerleader, dancer, and enjoys acting. And she surprised her team of doctors and family the most when she took up weightlifting. It sure surprised me. The Wumps Cat Powerlifting Team? Oh, yes, sir. Are you, are, you a, are you a big weightlifter? Um, well, not really. Um, some, some of the teachers suggested that I give it a try, and so I did, and I got third place at regionals. In the first year that she did it, she was 100%, went to practices, did what she had to do, Coming out of her um, freshman year, she came to me and she was like, Mom, it's a little bit harder on my body than I thought. I'm, I'm not really interested in doing it anymore. And I told her, I said, you gave it a shot, you tried it. And so it's not something that you want to do and I'm fine with that, but find something else to replace it with. And so she's joined theater and several Civitan clubs and whatnot. So she's doing well as far as that goes. The whole time we try to tell her faith and positivity and not to let anything push you down. You just continue to be the ray of sunshine that, that she's always been. The family has moved into a new home this year after fire destroyed theirs last year. They almost didn't survive it. We had to escape out of a window and I just remember being very, very scared, but the good Lord saved us, and I feel very blessed. People don't really know love until they have a child. And the day she was born, I was standing there. I just broke down, because I, I seen what was going on with the hole in her palate and all this, and I was thinking, what have I done, you know, for her to have to, I thought I was being punished, which maybe something I'd done in my life. But she has been a blessing, and she's the most Christian girl that you'll ever meet. Thank you. And 
I'm so very proud of her and I'd do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki Mars praises Children's Hospital in New Orleans, calls it a safe haven for them with wonderful doctors. She says the Leesville community has been there for them all the way. Riley serves on the town's Mayor's Youth Council and suggests ways others can be served. Everything that she faces, everything that she does, she's never once been scared to try anything. She wants to be a child advocate lawyer. Uh, she wants to write children's books. We're proud of everything that she has accomplished, everything that she wants to accomplish. We're excited to say what the future holds for her. LPB's Louisiana Young Heroes is presented this year by the generous support of the propane dealers of Louisiana with additional sponsorship by Hancock Whitney, Community Coffee, Demco, and Hotel Indigo. That's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anywhere, wherever you are, with our LPB app. And you can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.